Hi everybody and welcome to part one of the uh, restoration, hopefully, of the uh, Hampton FM 800 Mono FM receiver. Now what do we mean by Mono? Simply put, Mono means that there was only one signal broadcast from the uh, FM station. Today we're spoiled by stereo. A broadcast uh, station on FM puts out two signals in one and your decoder within your receiver, be it in a uh, car radio or a home stereo, is able to take that uh, signal and take it apart from its different parts and put it through two different channels so when you hear it on the outside, you hear stereo. Now, why was there such a push for stereo? Because, you know, we see with two eyes, okay, and we hear with two ears. But imagine in life if everything was always just heard with, with one ear. But because we hear with two ears, we're able to hear things in stereo as we go around. But until 1962, really, it was really almost impossible to achieve stereo without going through uh, crazy conniptions and uh, engineering feats to, uh, to accomplish it. Way back in 1881 in Paris, they set up a... Uh, they, they set up 10 different uh, microphones to record, maybe it was 1891, to set up, they set up 10 different microphones across a stage where a symphony or or orchestra was playing, and then they played back each one of those 10 different microphone signals that was generated, they played back on 10 different speakers set up in a huge hall, and people could come in and really enjoy what was really the first stereophonic music because every microphone that was set up across the stage that was capturing the music from the symphony orchestra was hearing different parts of the uh, symphony orchestra. If the microphones were set up on the uh, right side, they were hearing more of the woodwinds. If people happened to be sitting where uh, they were getting the feed from the left side speaker, they'd be hearing the uh, strings, right? Because strings sit to the left of the uh, conductor. You understand what I'm saying. Depending on where you were sitting, you could have a totally different sort of hearing experience. But trying to get that in the human ear through uh, stereophonic music was an engineering was an engineering challenge that vexed people. The Western Electric Corporation, part of the uh, Bell system, AT&T, developed the early stereo systems that they used, uh, I think, in 1940. There was, uh, um, I don't know, there was a Disney movie, I think, that uh, uh, used uh, early ancient stereo, but it was all impractical. It was huge equipment, and as far as getting it down to the consumer level, it was almost impossible to achieve that. Well, we're not going to go much more. It's going to be on a separate to upload a uh, little bit of the history of FM and development of stereo because it's, it's, it's a history that's uh, fraught with victories and defeats and death, suicides. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing story. But today we want to turn our attention to this piece of gear in front of me, the Hampton FM 800. Now, I believe the Hampton FM 800. I can't find a lot of information about it. The only reason I know it's an a FM 800 is because on the back plate of the, the bottom plate of the uh, receiver, it has FM tuner model number FM 800 made by the Shell Electronic Manufacturing Corporation of, of uh, West Barry, New York. And I think about 1958. But you know what, guys? If you Google that, FM, FM 800, Hampton FM 800 uh, tuner and Shell Electronic Manufacturing Corporation, you don't get anything. It's one of those companies that must have been a flash in the pan, and it's so obscure that I was unable to get a schematic or the architectural electric plan that shows how it is put together. So knowing all those things to begin with, I uh, picked up this particular device on eBay for, for just a few dollars, okay, as a non-working item. So let's uh, let's bring you down here to a bench side now, and I'm going to get the uh, pointer a little bit and talk about some of the uh, salient features and some of the challenges that lay ahead of us as we try to restore this uh, Hampton FM 800 FM Monio, Mono receiver 
but with the capability for multiplex. We're not going to worry about what that means right now. We're only going to worry about trying to get the receiver gone. Okay, so let's have some fun. Let's get in close and talk about some stuff. As you can see, no doubt, uh, you know, I have a very dusty unit. This, you, this unit, I believe this unit was manufactured in 1958. So we're both the same age. So that's kind of exciting, isn't it? And uh, But it was dusty. I don't know how long it sat. The person who put it on eBay, A, either gave up for, on it, trying to fix it, or B, just wanted to get it out of their house. You can see that the, uh, the uh, cabinet is a nice cabinet, but it's in really, really uh, rough shape. It's got a lot of, uh, lot of scars, a lot of battle scars on it. And you can see that the unit itself, I've cleaned up the uh, face plate a lot. I'll just remove that right now, but you can see the Hampton down there and it's a very handsome it was nowhere as good looking when i first got it as it is now because uh i just wanted to have a little fun i didn't want to tear into the electronics of it and one night i got uh let me see if i can find it here i got this stuff called uh never doll i think it's up in the uh, cabinet yeah i got this magic wadding stuff called uh never doll and it's little wads it stinks like the devil but it really did a nice job of cleaning up that uh, front. But when I got the unit, uh, you know, and this thing was all dirty. The uh, the uh, dial on it was dirty as could be. And also the uh, dial pointer, pointer that moves along there was all bound up because this plate was actually bent all backwards here. And uh, as a result, all the tuning mechanism, the tuning and dial string and everything was all screwed up and all bound on it so what would happen is when i plugged it in and i used the variac here which slowly brings up ac power very slowly i had my uh, safety glasses on and i slowly brought power up to the unit and uh, in very short order i don't know why i didn't notice it immediately there was a tube missing in the back and i did not have a schematic to try to figure out what tube was missing well, since it was close to the uh, transformer, it actually wasn't missing. It was broken. And I'll give you guys a look at it here. And uh, unfortunately, the glass was missing. And the glass is where the name of the uh, tube is written on it. Now, I know a lot about vacuum tubes. And I know about the uh, grid system here. And you can see this ladder has three different holes in it. I figured since it was near the uh, transformer here, it was probably a rectifier tube. Or something that takes AC power and converts it to uh, to DC, or takes DC to AC, one or the other. Either way, rectifier tubes can uh, have the ability to do that. They're like a series of quad diodes, like we would use today. I was able to determine that this uh, this tube was actually uh, likely to be probably 100% likely. It was going to be a uh, 6x4 6 volt rectifier tube and I was able to uh, I was able to track one down and uh, here it is and you can see I don't know how well you can see it on the front of it it says up there 6x4 and that is a rectifier tube so I was able to secure one of them but underneath of it we have to get in we've got to look we got some wiring issues under there that we've got to get straightened out and uh, you know we have a short that's preventing it from powering up so that's what we want to do today is take a, a look underneath here and if you've never seen underneath the bottom before and let me tell you something else some of you might be wondering what is this tube here and this tube is actually designed to go right out the front there that's called a tuning eye tube and probably 95 percent of the people alive today have never seen something like that. In the old days when you tuned in stations you didn't have meters or indicator dial, uh, dial pointer meters that would tell you if you had the station tuned in as well as it could be. This thing actually has a green eye that opens and closes. If you're not on the station it's, it's sort of in an open position but as you get closer to uh, tuning in the station to the best it can be the green eye closes up and the circle is closed and you know you're you're really uh, tuned right on the uh, channel well I'll tell you guys 
we got a hell of a long way to go before we see that kind of thing if we ever do so we want to go underneath now and if you've never seen underneath you've got to make sure you're unplugged this is what the uh, underside typically of a tube tuner is now what is a tuner it's the electronic device it picks up FM broadcast and then it takes it and sends it to uh, an amplifier and that's what the outputs are for there. I'm choosing to use the uh, Technics SA424 as my amplifier. If we get this thing going, you'll see a dual feed in the back where you have two RCA type of plugs going in the back. It also has a strange thing up here called uh, multiplex. We're not going to worry about that right now. It has a switched AC outlet where you can plug the amp into here. So if you start the um, start the receiver up here, the tuner, the amp goes on at the same time. And it also has a place to hook up uh, an antenna. Well, inside we have some problems here. I've seen some uh, loose wires. So I want to get the soldering iron amp and I want to touch up some of those. I've done a little preliminary work checking some of these uh, capacitors, some of these electrolytic capacitors here. And believe it or not, all these components test out really good, which really surprises me. Because a lot of times the uh, capacitors, the devices that are like small batteries that hold charges and release it inside of electronic devices, a lot of times they can be bad and some of the resistors can be bad too. My guess is that this unit did not see a lot of hard use because the average person in 58 they might have used it two or three years and then stereo came out they didn't need this anymore and they put it in the closet so let's get the uh, soldering iron heated up and let's carefully sit this unit upside down we want to make sure we're uh, the power's off of course and unplugged we're running into the very act and um, we'll go ahead and touch up some of these uh, soldering joints did it come undone and then uh, we'll see where we stand all right it's probably a little hard for you guys to uh, see down here board side don't know there's the solder there but there's a lot of quite a few uh, loose connections down here that aren't making good electrical contact and a lot of time that can be one of the reasons for what's wrong so I got a real hot uh, real hot soldering iron here and I think it's a uh, it's a Weller, which I really like. So we'll go ahead and touch up some of these uh, connections in here, which are uh, are gone bad. We'll add a little solder. It looks like a few cold connections, a few cold solder connections here. And there was actually one place where the uh, wire going to one of the uh, to the grid on one of the tubes, and the grid is the thing that uh, it's like a uh, it's a fence that keeps electrons moving the right way across a uh, vacuum tube from the cathode to the plate. We'll be talking about that later in uh, future uh, episodes. But today we want to just try to get this thing running. And here's another place where this capacitor wasn't even properly spanning across here. So we want to get that. Uh, a cold solder joint is one that really hasn't been made properly. And it looks like somebody attempted to do some repairs in here. And kind of did a little bit of a... Uh, bungling job so we want to touch up a lot of these uh, connections and I'll try to bring you in a little bit closer so you can see what I'm doing here all right until I get the overhead track I guess this will have to do for now but uh, yeah at various points in here I'm seeing uh, what they call the cold solder joints which aren't uh, which aren't properly uh, the connections aren't good there should be a gloss to the uh, solder when the soldering is done correctly so I'm just touching the iron on and adding a little bit of uh, solder to get stuff touched up here for better connections like I said there were a couple loose wires over here I can see there's one not really touching so I want to make sure I get a really good connection especially on some of these uh, tube pins and just shake off the excess totter, solder also the antenna was hardly even connected at all and uh, that's a no-go so we want to hit that with a little bit of solder and we want to make sure all the uh, all the joints all the connections here are really really good well I've already done a lot of these over the last uh, two nights and I really just wanted to finish up on this side like I said I've checked all the uh, components inside we're not going to talk about what they do there's resistors there's capacitors in here and they all perform 
different functions. Our goal, though, is not to teach and instruct on this on the first one, but our goal is to really try to see if we can bring this unit back to life. It also looks like somebody did a little wiring that was improper when they went to change out a part. They didn't get the uh, capacitor here set on the right uh, pin of the tube. So there's no way this ever would have worked. And it's probably one of the reasons that the uh, that the uh, rectifier tube ended up uh, failing because it sent a wrong kind of electrical signal back to there. So. We'll give that a minute to cool off and we'll turn it over and that's one of the first things you want to do when you're trying to assess electronic stuff to repair. You want to get a uh, magnifying glass, a really good power magnifying glass and go in and just take a visual examination of all the uh, connections and make sure that everything is, uh, is properly connected. A lot of times uh, wires will come loose over time or solder joints aren't properly paid uh, aren't properly made I know this can look extraordinarily complex but these are so easy tube equipment compared to uh, compared to uh, solid state stuff with integrated circuits because we're used to printed circuit boards now where all these components would be on a printed circuit board at that time everything was just point to point wiring you would just take this and stretch it to where it needed to be the two ends and solder it down so although it looks extremely complicated, it's a very, very simple piece of equipment. It's only made to pull a signal, a broadcast signal, out of the air and send that over to another piece of equipment, an amplifier, to be uh, amplified so we can hear it. One thing I think is indispensable when you're working with uh, tube, uh, tube receivers and things like that is the uh, being able to have a uh, tube tester. So in a second, I'll bring you down and show you how that works. Okay, I want to tell you guys, a tube tester is a really great device to have. I'm testing one of the uh, output tubes here, the 6AU6, and the way it works is you have this little reference panel, and I have this beautiful uh, Accurate Instrument Company's uh, tube tester that I bought. It's really small, it's really portable, and it's really nice. I can take it into the field with me. And all you do is go into the book and you look up the uh, 6AU6, which I have there. It tells you it's a D filament type. So you put this uh, filament setting on D. And then it uh, tells you that it goes in socket number 3, which is up here. And then the, uh, the sensitivity, 6AU6, which is on uh, 30, which is fine. And then we can go ahead and uh, all we have to do, we got it plugged in, we've got the unit on. All we have to do is push this red button and it puts it through the test. It tells you whether it's good or bad. So here we go. And she's coming up really nice. Now a few of these weren't so nice, but they were in the okay area, the good. They were a little to the right of the question mark. Which means they're still usable, but they have a little bit of uh, maybe leakage in them, but they'll be fine for our purposes. We don't want to put a ton of money into the uh, receiver over there. So, All right, I've now finished testing every one of the uh, tubes and the uh, new uh, 6X4 rectifier tube that I bought. So we'll get it, go ahead, close the kit up here, and then uh, go ahead and uh, try putting a little power to the unit and see what we get. All right, guys, this is a critical moment of truth in uh, our restoration project. We've I've fixed a lot of soldering problems underneath of the chassis. I've tested all the components. We're not going to go into testing components and all that kind of stuff, but I've tested all of the tubes, okay? And I don't think I have any uh, shorts in it now. So what I want to do now is slowly bring power to the unit to see what kind of life I get to it. So you want to do this very slowly. You'll notice I have safety glasses on just in case. And I also have a Variac which allows me to very slowly bring up power on the unit. Uh, if I was using a much bigger an amplifier or something like that, I'd have what's called an isolation transformer. That would protect a lot of other stuff from blowing here or, or causing huge problems by isolating just that particular uh, item. But I'm not going to worry about now because this is a relatively uh, benign sort of uh, uh, tube set up here. There's not a lot of dangerous voltages and stuff running around. It's, a, it's just a detector. That's all it is. It's not an amplifier. So I've now put on the uh, 
the uh, variac here and I have it at zero I'm gonna now switch the power on to the unit and you're seeing this the first time like I am right now so we're gonna slowly bring up the power and I'll bring you down in a second and we're gonna check the tubes I can see where we have our front lights our lighting here and I'm coming down here and I'm looking at the uh, tubes now and yeah, it does look like I'm getting uh, getting some glow on each of the tubes. Yeah, I can see the oscillating tube here. The rectifier tube's got a glow on it. I'll bring you down and show you. We're only running about uh, 65 you volts can, uh, right I now. think I can definitely see, yes, a green glow, which would indicate to me that our tuning eye is not dead. And that tested out good. You can see the glow of the uh, rectifier, excuse me, the oscillator tube there. And yeah, I can see some red down below there. Now, yep, and I can see you're glowing in there. So I'm now going to push her up to about uh, 90 volts. And wow, you can really see that tuning eye coming to life now. Remember, we don't have any output hooked up here. We're just seeing this tuning eye will be able to tell us whether we're picking up any stations or not as it opens and uh, closes. So, so far so good. Nothing smoking. We're going to put it up to about 105. Yes, yeah, so you can really see the glow of that tuning eye. Let's see if it changes as we go down the aisle, as we uh, go down the dial here. Check the, uh, check the tuning eye and you'll be able to see whether it opens or closes. Yeah, did you see that? That means it's that when it's off, when it's open like that, it's not on a station. But as it locks in a station, that eye closes. It's kind of cool, eh? And like I said before, probably 95% of the people in the world today have never seen a uh, tuning eye. This preceded meters and things like that. So obviously this is picking up stations. I did hook a uh, crappy little antenna I have just going up here. Nothing fancy, but it must be good enough to uh, pick up stations. So, based on that, I think we probably have a good chance of uh, having a working device. You can see everything's nice and heated up now. We've got good glow on all of the uh, tubes. So, yeah, I'm getting excited. Are you? All the uh, repair work, the straightening, I've cleaned all the switches and everything else. So, today was the first day I addressed all those uh problems with the uh, soldering so I'm really happy to see the uh, tuning eye opening and closing here as it's drifting off stations and then it finds a station goes off of it so yeah this is really old school and I am very very excited let's put the output on let's keep the volume real low and let's see if we can detect anything at all in the audio output all right, guys, I've actually uh, taken the uh, Technics SA424, and I've started that up now, and I have it on auxiliary mode, and I've run two inputs, the RCA jacks from the back of the uh, Hampton FM800. I have that running over to the output, and I have the volume very, very low, and as you can hear, all we're really basically getting now is kind of uh, static. We don't have the AFC tuner on. I'll take you down a little lower and you can watch the uh, tuning eye as we attempt to get a uh, station tuned in here. There we go. Probably tune the eye. So let's see what happens. I don't want to blow anything out. Come to town. Turn that down a little bit, the amplifier. Go down the tuner dial here. Heritage Salvage dot com. Let's 
pretty darn clean. This thing probably hasn't been run in 40 years. Can you get me? Trying to get the classical music station. He was a music. Well, I am excited, guys. It looks like it's working. I'm not going to fiddle with any of the uh, up buttons and stuff because the next thing I want to do now, I'm assuming it's going to work okay. I'll flip the AFC, the automatic fine tuning control, once. You have to give us a couple. That's really clean. And that allows you to, so you don't have a lot of static between stations. We've got tons of good CDs we can uh, give. Tons. It jumps from station to station. I have it off now. And look at how the tuning eye opens and closes. Pretty cool, huh? Well, that's what we had, guys. Listen to how clean that is. I don't even, here's the AFC on now. I don't even know if the power's up all the way. No, we're not even at, now we're at full power, 120 volts. Not much up the dial. No, nope, not much at all up there. Pretty cool, eh? Classical music is always the true test because it has so much quiet between movements. Alright guys, pretty darn cool. Alright guys, I admit it, I'm excited. You know, but it's one thing to have a working unit. It's another thing to take care of uh, a unit that has a case of the terminal uglies. Is this, cert this one certainly did. So, what I want to do in part two is start to address that. Uh, I think fidelity wise, I'm not going to do a lot to this because it's sounding pretty good. I'm very happy with uh, how clean that is. But the dark begins to shrink when you find the one you know. All right, that's pretty cool. I've turned it off. So what I want to do now is uh, work on making a unit that you would be uh, proud to have in your home. Anyway, this concludes uh, part one. Don't you dare miss part two when we uh, cure the cur the case of the uglies. And uh, take this uh, ugly duckling to a uh, beautiful swan. And I think you guys will really appreciate how cool tube tuners and tube amplifiers are. Stay tuned for part two.